let's begin with those by-elections. Everyone thought it was going to be a Labour whitewash. Everyone was talking about, well, that's it for the Tories. They've blown it. They've lost it. It's guaranteed now that Starmer's going to saunter into number 10 with all of his eco-policies. But is he? Instead, what we saw was three very different results. We saw a Lib Dem win. We saw a Labour win. And we saw the Conservatives holding on by the skin of their teeth. So is the next general election a done deal? Or is there a lot more that could play out in the next year or so? We don't know when that election's going to be. And of course, what would the Conservatives need to do to cling on to power? Well, critics of Rishi Sunak are basically saying to him, mate, you're not Conservative enough. You need to get on back on board with the True Blues. You need to be scrapping your net zero pledges. You need to be essentially putting out the sort of policies they did in the last election and then completely failed to stick to. Do you think Rishi Sunak needs to righten up a bit, if you will, to stay in power? Does he deserve to be given the boot? Should it be Labour at the next general election? Or are you fed up with the lot of them? Do we need a complete and utter change at the top of government? So let's discuss all of this with Simon Danchuk. Simon, it's great to have you on the programme. What are your thoughts? Were you surprised by those election results? No, I wasn't surprised, Alex. Uh, the truth is, it, they, they told us exactly what we already knew. Labour are doing fairly well. Uh, the Conservatives are not doing very well at all. Uh, people vote Liberal Democrat uh, for protest reasons. Uh, and there's quite a lot of people out there that don't like Sadiq Khan. So we, we knew that before the uh, by-elections and we certainly know it now. Do you think that, you know, that, that there is when people are going out to vote now, is this based on policy or is this sort of more football mentality that I'm going to support a party that I've always supported, or I'm going to punish the party that I used to support and aren't doing well? Or are people actually listening to some of these pledges and, and, and picking a shopping list of what they want the government to do? Yeah, I think that's a series of good questions, actually. You've got to bear in mind these are by-elections, uh, so there's a lot of tactical voting going on. Uh, looking at the figures, there's no doubt about it that the Conservative voters uh, stayed at home in these uh, by-elections. They're unhappy with the government, so they decided uh, to stay at home. Uh, you should also bear in mind that the Liberal Democrats and Labour are exceptionally good in by-elections. They fight a very good ground war, uh, get lots of their volunteers into by-election areas uh, and really pound the street. Uh, so this skews the results of by-elections to an extent. Uh, people also want to give the government a bloody nose in the middle of a, uh, a middle of a you know th their term in office. So what's played out in the by-elections might not be quite what plays out at the general election. Having said all of that, Rishi Sunak clearly asked to step up to the mark and start tackling some of these bigger issues that people are really concerned about. If he's going to get his vote out or they will just stay at home come the general election. But he's, he's sort of done this, hasn't he? He's promised his, his five big pledges, you know, stopping the boats, for example. And you know, But he's not delivering on it. Is this the problem? The fact that he is making promises, things that very clearly people want to see delivered in this country, the big talking points of uh, 2023. And... Although he's saying he's going to get the job done, he's just frankly failing to. But but could he? Yeah, he's still got time. Uh, inflation was one of his tar one of his five pledges, and that's starting to come down uh, more quickly uh, this week than we anticipated. So that's good news for him. Uh, stopping the boats uh, is clearly proving a challenge, but he's got the legislation through Parliament now. Uh, we should see the Rwanda. Uh, migration policy beginning to work and it's about time uh, that it did. Uh, he's hamstrung in terms of the NHS. He said he'd get waiting lists down uh, and that's proving a problem, not least because of the junior doctor's strike. Uh, but it, it, hopefully he will tackle that and he'll blame the doctors if he doesn't manage to uh, achieve that tar target. Growing the economy is proving a challenge. But there are also these other issues that he hasn't pledged on, that he has started to say that he's going to tackle and he's come out fighting today saying he's going to start tackling antisocial behaviour, begging, uh, those types of issues. And I think that's important. These are those smaller issues, but still very relevant to, to the electorate and things that people feel are going wrong in the country. Yeah, I mean, it seems to me that Keir Starmer is also having to have a period of reflection as well about his own party's policy on ULEZ, um, which he sees as being uh, the, the cause, perhaps, for Labour's great failure to snatch Uxbridge. Um, it seems to me that both parties are having a bit of a fight 
for the right wing of, um, of politics at the moment, which seems to be where most people in the general public are at. And I think most people out there think that nobody's actually going to deliver on the things they want done. Is this really where the battleground is? Or would Labour perhaps be better served by sticking with their sort of more left-wing policies and, and uh, essentially trying to reconnect with their core vote? Yeah, I've been very amused by Keir Starmer over the last few days. He is criticising uh, Sadiq Khan for the ULES policy. Uh, I don't agree with the ULES policy, but the irony of Keir Starmer coming out and criticising Khan over it is is beyond belief. I mean, Keir has tied himself to Ed Miliband and everything uh, environmental for the last couple of years. Uh, he's stopping uh, oil uh, gas extraction in the North Sea. He's going to borrow £28 billion per year to create green jobs, uh, which will increase inflation and, and probably increase taxation as well. Uh, so it's a bit ironic that he's tied himself to Ed Miliband's environmental agenda for two years, and then he comes out being critical of uh, Sadiq Khan over the last couple of days and blames him for having lost this uh, by-election. I don't think Keir knows whether he's to the left or whether he's to the right. Uh, and that will be a concern for Labour coming closer to the general election. All the flip-flopping that uh, Keir's been doing over the last couple of years is probably going to come on to roost and going to cut, cut, as it has done in that by-election, actually, cost him some votes. Well, if you've just joined us, we are, of course, still mopping up those election results, the three big by-elections that's happened, um, and discussing, does anybody know who's on the left or the right anymore? If you've got an opinion, please do give me a call. The number is 03444991000, 03444991000, or you can text TALK and your message to 87 treble two. Um, so, I mean, Rishi Sunak should consider perhaps abandoning some of those key net zero pledges in the wake of the shock Uxbridge by-election win. It seems to me, as you were saying, that this is this is very much where the public are at and uh, both parties are now going to have to potentially start thinking about moving into that space. Yeah, I think the voters of Uxbridge in this by-election have done us all a favour, really. We, we, we are going at high speed towards these net zero targets, which are completely unachievable, causing real concern for a good number of people, irrespective of whether you drive cars or not. You know, the, the phasing out of gas boilers in houses by 2035, uh, getting rid of all petrol cars by 2030 just isn't realistic and, and causes a lot of concern for a lot of people. For example, I have a very small Fiat car. I hardly drive it because I like to use public transport. But the idea that I can't use it at all, and it will probably last me till after 2030 because I hardly ever use it. But on, on all these measures, I've got to get rid of it relatively soon. The, the I mean, problem this here, just the, the, isn't realistic. Yeah, I mean, the problem here, though, Simon, is, you know, if you put this to any of the main party leaders, whatever they might pledge to the general public, they're all going to turn around and say, well, we've essentially signed an international treaty at this point to stick with these net zero targets that is going to be very difficult to wriggle out of. And then, of course, you're going to have the cohort of people screaming about the world being on fire. Yeah, well, they have to be able to... Do that. That's what provides strong leadership in terms of dealing with those that shout loudest. Just just because we have Just Stop Oil on our streets, it doesn't mean that they're in a majority. And, and taking a, taking some leadership in internationally is also important. Perhaps railing back from some of the commitments that we've initially made. Perhaps it wasn't realistic to sign up to those uh, agreements uh, so many years ago. It's a bit like the European... Uh, court on human rights and how that impacts on us uh, in terms of tackling illegal immigration. We need some strong leadership, uh, some political leaders coming forward who say that isn't acceptable. The international agreements don't always suit us as a country. That's why we came out of the European Union. These are the reasons we came out of the European Union. And in Britain, we're going to do things a little bit differently. But is there really anybody prepared to do that, to not tow the international line, so to speak? Because it strikes me now that in the 21st century, when governments get elected, whatever's written in their manifesto, they may as well just burn it the day after. Because even when it comes to deciding the pay of policemen, You've got the independent pay review body when it comes to our climate agenda, our net zero targets. That's decided at international level. I mean, what is left, even though we've left the EU, what is left for governments to actually decide? 
Yes, well, that, that's, a, that's a really, really good point. We need strong political leadership, and I think that's why the public are so despondent. We've got Rishi Sunak, who's very managerial. Uh, he's set out his pledges. He's trying to achieve them. He's, he's pretty good on the economy. That That's his forte. But it's not very strong political leadership. We've got Keir Starmer, who's not dissimilar. And as you were sort of intimating earlier, they, they are fighting over the centre ground. But I think people in Britain are really centre-right. That's where they sit naturally. And they want some stronger leadership with somebody who's going to be more forthright in setting out the agenda. The sad news is I don't think they're going to get that after the next general election. They'll either get Sunak or Starmer and they'll still be relatively dissatisfied. Yeah, Simon, fascinating talking to you. Always great to have your opinion. Simon Danchuk there. We are, of course, discussing those recent by-election results. Is there going to be a straightforward transfer of power to the Labour Party at the next general election? Are they going to just walk straight into number 10? Or do the three by-election results, of course, a win for the Lib Dems, a win for the Labour Party, and a surprise win, perhaps, for the Conservatives in Uxbridge, indicate that this is not going to be a one-horse race or even a two-horse race, that the field could actually be opened up. Well